Well, today I want to tell you about my favorite objects in physics, namely black holes. I guess most of you have heard a lot about black holes and recognize them as uh, pretty spectacular objects out there in our universe. Uh, but a less widely appreciated, but to me far more fascinating fact, is that black holes also happen to be incredibly powerful theoretical constructs, which underlie the deep relations between seemingly disparate areas of physics. Well, I guess most people find black holes rather mind-boggling, and yet such objects can provide illuminating insight into the more mundane physical systems which we encounter in almost everyday life. So in this talk, I want to give you some sense of this multifaceted nature of black holes. Well, I guess I should start by explaining what a black hole actually is. And well, you can get various answers depending on who you ask. The simplest answer that it's a region which can never be seen from outside might not convey much to you yet. Um, many of you might be anticipating the more colloquial answer that it's a region where gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape its pull. That's perhaps easier to visualize, though probably for the wrong reason. But I'm not here to shelter you from stretching your imagination. That's what you came for. And so I'll try to illuminate how I think about black holes. But since black holes are, in effect, made from the very fabric of space and time, I should first tell you how we think about space and time. Well, as you know, our paradigm has shifted uh, quite a bit over the centuries. The Aristotelian view had us at the very center of the universe with the various uh, orbiting heavenly bodies being quite different from the earthly realm. Space and time were unquestionably absolute. And I guess the notion of what they would look like somewhere else probably didn't even occur. This apparently self-evident view started shifting during the Renaissance when Nicolas Copernicus proposed a model of the universe with the sun at the center rather than the Earth. This triggered the first scientific revolution and eventually led to the present-day Copernican principle that our location in the universe is not special at all and elsewhere, therefore, looks pretty much the same as it looks here. Galileo Galilei bravely championed Copernicus's view and further dispensed with the notion of absolute rest, realizing that the same laws apply equally to observers traveling at different velocities. And so, for example, if you fall asleep before your plane takes off and uh, wake up mid-flight, if it wasn't for the external indicators like the hum of the plane engine, you would not be able to tell that you're suddenly moving hundreds of miles per hour faster. For that matter, we're not noticing particularly right now that the Earth is whizzing around the sun at a briskly 67,000 miles per hour. Um, but so far, forces were deemed to act instantaneously across space. And in particular, this hypothesis was upheld by another key figure in the scientific revolution, Sir Isaac Newton, who famously realized that gravity acts on all objects alike. So, for example, the Earth goes around the Sun because it is pulled by the gravitational force exerted by the mass of the Sun, just as apples on Earth fall under the pull of Earth's gravity. But the notion of instantaneity started falling apart in the later part of the 19th century when James Clerk Maxwell realized that electricity and magnetism are simply flip sides of the same coin, and the disturbances in one can create the other. This means that an oscillating electric field gives rise to a magnetic field, which in turn creates an electric field and so forth, so you get a self-sustaining wave. So Maxwell calculated that this wave propagates at the astounding speed of 186,000 miles per second, and thereby identified that this is nothing but our good old light. And so we learn that electromagnetic forces do not propagate instantaneously. Their carrier, called the photon, which you can think of as a quantum of light, travels at this finite speed. Now, 20 years later, 
Michelson and Morley experimentally verified that the speed is indeed the same no matter which direction we look in. In other words, it's quite independent of Earth's velocity. So uh, this is where we come to the more interesting era, the so-called second scientific revolution. In 1905, Albert Einstein realized that in order for the speed of light to be the same for everyone, no matter how fast they're traveling, neither space nor time can be absolute. Space and time are only meaningful as a single quantity, the so-called space-time. Now, this new theory called special relativity marked a major leap forward, and is this still crucially used today, uh, for instance, in particle physics, where uh, gravity is negligible, but the particles are moving very fast. But Einstein wasn't done. There was still gravity to account for, and Newton's laws certainly didn't fit into the uh, new framework. So it take, took Einstein another decade to uh, formulate a relativistic theory of gravity, but the result was one of the most spectacular achievements in the history of mankind. The new theory called general relativity posits that space-time can get warped by presence of matter or energy, and it is this warpage that manifests itself as gravity. And so this is finally the framework which will allow me to explain black holes, so let me tell you a little bit more about general relativity. Well, Einstein's key idea was that since gravity affects all objects alike, we should identify it with another universal quantity, namely the curvature of space-time. Now, you can think about space-time in a two-dimensional analogy as a rubber sheet. When there's nothing on the sheet, it is flat, but putting a heavy object on the sheet will make a dimple, and the more compact the object, the larger the dimple. Now, if you roll a small marble on the sheet, it will no longer look like it's going in a straight line. It will still try to follow the straightest possible path, but the sheet itself is curved, and so the, particle, the marble's trajectory effectively gets uh, deflected by this curvature. Okay, so to summarize, uh, space-time tells matter how to move, and matter, in turn, tells space-time how to curve. And so unlike all the previous paradigms, where space-time was just, was just a passive arena on which all that action took place, in general relativity, space-time itself is the star actor. And so now we understand that the Earth goes around the sun not because it's pulled by any force, but rather because it's trying to follow the straightest possible path in the curved space-time produced by the sun's mass. Earth, likewise, curves space-time around itself, and we too, along with apples and everything else, follow straightest possible trajectories when we're in free fall. But this is not just a new description in a fancier language. It corrects Newton's picture where it would have gone wrong, and it predicts new effects. Now, in everyday human experience, these relativistic effects are fairly negligible, although precision instruments, such as the global positioning system, is sensitive enough to them to the extent that uh, without accounting for general relativity, the GPS units in our cell phones would really quickly get us of course uh, with the error accumu accumulating by uh, about 20 feet per minute. But in our cosmos, the effects predicted by general relativity are much more striking. So here is an example of how dramatically space-time can get warped. Uh, now, many of you might have seen this simulation before, but I find it so cool that I can't resist showing it regardless. So what you see here is a starry sky, much like our own, but in the foreground, there are two objects which deflect the light from the distant stars. Now, they happen to be black holes, and, well, in this picture, they do sort of look like holes in the starry field, but that is misleading. They're not holes in the background sky, but rather a warp pitch of the foreground. So you can see this better if I run the movie. Uh, the black holes orbit around each other, and so the deflection of the background light keeps changing with time. Um, so you can also see here another effect 
of general relativity, namely how these ripples in space-time uh, propagate outward. So just as Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism predicts electromagnetic waves, Einstein's theory of gravity predicts gravitational waves, and these likewise uh, propagate out at the speed of light. Now, these waves carry away energy, and so the black holes spiral closer and closer until they merge into a single black hole, just as you have just seen. Now, this last stage releases so much energy that if it were all converted to light, for that brief instant, it would have only shown the entire rest of the universe. So now that you have seen how black holes influence the surrounding space-time, let me explain what they are in greater detail. Well, as you can imagine, the more compact an object, the more it curves the surrounding space-time. In the extreme case, we get a black hole where the curvature is so large that it prevents all communication from that region uh, uh, to be propagated outside. Now, that might seem quite extraordinary, uh, but in uh, nature, this actually happens all the time, um, typically as the endpoint of a uh, star's uh, collapse, star's life cycle. Um, so to illustrate this, it's useful to draw a space-time diagram. So here I have drawn time as running upward, and space runs horizontally, but for convenience I have suppressed one of the spatial directions. So if you're an observer sitting on the origin, your uh, trajectory in space-time would be just this vertical line. Now a single event, such as a flash of light, uh, would be uh, described by a point here. But as the light propagates outward in all spatial directions, it forms this light cone. So if you take, took a snapshot uh, some given time later, the light front would be given by this uh, sphere uh, centered around the point where the original flash took place. Now, of course, we don't want to talk about actual flashes of light everywhere, but it's still useful to talk about hypothetical light cones because these tell us where it's possible for any physical observer to go. The trajectory must always remain within the local light cone. Now, suppose we have a collapsing star. At some early time, it's a large ball, and as time goes on, it gets smaller, so the full evolution looks like this. Um, the star implodes to a point here, and something strange happens to the space-time, uh, but I'll return to that in a moment. For now, let me uh, consider what happens uh, outside the star, which we can conveniently describe by these light cones. So far away from the star, the effect of it is negligible, and so the light cones look like they would without the star uh, there in the first place. But as you come closer, you see that these light cones start tilting. So in Newtonian language, we would say that the light has increasingly harder time climbing out of the ever deeper gravitational potential well of the star. Now at some point here, the light cones turn vertical. And so it means that light or anything else can no longer get back out of that region. And that is the black hole. Its surface is called the event horizon, and it is formed by the last rays that almost make it out, but instead forever hover on the surface of the black hole. Otherwise, nothing special seems to be happening at the horizon. If you fell through, uh, that moment would be uneventful. But if you, uh, well, you would have doomed yourself on a path of no return, and if you tried calling your friends or put on your emergency light beacon, the light you send out would never reach your friends. It would not encounter any barrier. It would simply fall inward with you. And no matter what you did subsequently, you would be irrevocably drawn to the central region I have indicated by this red line. That is the so-called curvature singularity. Here, space-time becomes infinitely curved, and the theory loses its predictive power. And so, um, in, in this sense, uh, general relativity predicts its own downfall. 
And so we know that there's more to come in our fundamental description of the universe. Now, this might all seem rather outlandish to you, and it certainly bothered Einstein 100 years ago. Um, in fact, even though Carl Schwarzschild wrote down the first black hole solution just months after Einstein's paper, it took half a century uh, uh, for the solution to be taken seriously. Before, it was just thought to be unphysical, almost an embarrassment to the otherwise beautiful theory. Now, uh, it wasn't until the 60s that John Wheeler actually coined the term black hole, and uh, people understood the theory well enough to start taking the solution seriously. So by that time, astrophysical observations caught up and propelled the field into what people call the golden era of black hole research in the 70s. Astrophysicists realized that black holes are actual physical objects, uh, typically formed from an implosion of a uh, sufficiently massive star. So here's an artist's conception of how a star can live its life over millions of years. The lighter elements get converted into heavier ones by nuclear fusion, which powers the star's radiation, until the more, most stable phase is reached. Now, if the star is sufficiently large to start with, the core suddenly implodes because the outward pressure no longer can compensate for the gravity. And uh, it, the gravitational potential energy gets released in a uh, supernova. Now, if the object was a couple of times as large as the uh, mass of the sun, it forms a neutron star, the densest known regular astronomical object. So its size would be scarcely larger than Manhattan. And uh, it, it's so dense that a half a cup of it would weigh as much as a mile long by mile wide by mile tall slab of lead. But that was a mild scenario. More heavier remnants uh, undergo further collapse and then irrevocably form a black hole. Now, it no longer makes sense to talk about density since the entire star collapses to a to singularity. But just to give you a sense, if the entire Earth collapsed to a black hole, its size would be only about this big. And um, now in the process, further energy can get released in gamma ray burst. So in the uh, few minutes, uh, it's, uh, this releases uh, more energy than our sun would in over its entire lifetime. And so we see that uh, black holes are associated with highly energetic processes in our universe, which is one way we can observe them despite the fact that uh, we can never see a black hole directly since no light can ex escape from it. But these, uh, the black hole sort of influence the uh, surrounding space time so much that these provide telltale effects that we can see. So for example, uh, identifying Sagittarius uh, star um, at, at the center of our galaxy as a supermassive black hole was first achieved by observing uh, star's orbits around it uh, um, and detecting the black hole. Um, more extremely, uh, if a star gets to a vicinity of a comparably sized black hole, it literally gets ripped apart. More typically, uh, accreting matter gets heated up to very high temperatures, and we then see the characteristic radiation uh, from this object. And now, um, the newly operational Event Horizon Telescope uh, can actually resolve uh, the size of the uh, horizon. And on top of all that, we have entered the era of the gravitational wave detection. I think it's rather fitting that almost precisely 100 years, 100 years after Einstein's formulation of uh, general relativity, we have finally detected gravitational waves uh, by LIGO in September 2015. And another announcement was made just yesterday. Um, so um, this, the, the, and this is actually no mean feat because uh, such, uh, to observe such waves requires as much sensitivity as, say, resolving the thickness of a human hair 
in the distance to Proxima Centauri, our nearest star. And so the fact that we could detect this at all is uh, an incredible testament to human ingenuity. Now from these signals, we can extract a whole uh, deal of information about uh, what took place, in this case, over, uh, uh, well, almost uh, tens of the age of the universe, billions of years ago. So by comparing the, to the predictions of general relativity, we can learn what types of objects form these black holes, how heavy they were, and so forth. So through all these observations, we can now get estimates on how many black holes there actually are in the universe. And we find that there are lots. So already in our own galaxy, there are over uh, 100 million black holes. So if you add up all the galaxies, uh, the entire universe has 100 quadrillion such black holes. That's 10 to the 17, or one with 17 zeros after it. Far more than, say, all the grains of sand in the entire Sahara Desert. Um, now, at, each, at its core, each galaxy also has a supermassive black hole, which is easily billions of solar masses and size as large as a solar system. Now, in, compared to that, our own supermassive black hole at, uh, in our galaxy is relatively meager with a size of, uh, well, mass of only a few million suns. And more black holes are formed every second somewhere in the universe. So by the time I finish this talk, there will be thousands more. Now, that's a lot of black holes, but, well, you don't have to be uh, worried about being swallowed up just yet because the universe is so vast. So the nearest observed black hole is in the Sagittarius arm of our galaxy, a comfortable 1,600 light years away. Okay. So um, I have uh, told you what I think of as actually the least significant in my mind aspect of black holes. My main purpose was to let you build up some intuition for what they are and to give you a sense of how extreme they are as astrophysical object. And so I think you're now well prepared to uh, appreciate how preposterous it would be to uh, think that you know, black holes could have any bearing on the more familiar objects we encounter here on Earth. And yet, incredible as that may sound, that's precisely what we have been learning over the last decade. And so to explain that, I will now turn to the mathematical description of black holes. So the um, main um, framework of uh, general relativity um, is uh, the Einstein's equation. Uh, which relates space-time curvature to matter distribution. One of the most studied solutions uh, of this equation is a black hole. And in fact, we learned that black holes can exist without any matter at all. Subramani and Chandrasekhar called them the most perfect macroscopic objects there are in the universe uh, because the only elements in their construction are our notions of space and time. Now, given how elegant and simple the solution is, it might seem remarkable that it can describe such an extreme object. But, well, in fact, I, I think the two are, uh, go hand in hand. But to see what makes black holes so simple, let us consider what would it take to, say, describe a star. Well, uh, at the least, you would have to describe all the stuff that fell into the star, which could already contain a lot of detailed information. In contrast, a black hole uh, can be described by just three numbers corresponding to its mass, angular momentum, and charge. John Wheeler described this by the memorable phrase, black holes have no hair. Now, where did all the important, I mean, all this detailed information go? is a very deep question, which I'll return to uh, in a moment. But for now, let's consider the consequences of this simplicity. Well, from a 
pragmatic standpoint, it's great because it allows us to study the detailed properties of the black hole explicitly. And we find many surprises. One of the early ones was that black holes actually uh, behave much more like ordinary systems than you might have thought. Okay, so let's consider what are the uh, basic quantities which characterize a black hole. Well, there are three important ones. One of them is the mass, which I have already mentioned. Another is the horizon area. And the third one is a sort of weird sounding quantity, so-called surface gravity, which you can think of as the force exerted at infinity to hold a unit mass suspended just above the horizon. So let's now compare this with uh, quantities that would describe some ordinary system, such as some fluid or uh, matter or um, um, gas or something. OK, if you don't want to uh, worry about all the microscopic uh, properties, uh, there you can describe the system by coarser quantities, namely temperature, energy, and entropy. I guess the least uh, familiar one of this is the entropy, although even this concept made it into the popular culture. Uh, entropy, roughly speaking, characterizes the amount of disorder in the system. So in this cartoon, if the kid didn't have so many things, there couldn't be as much disorder. And so another way of thinking about entropy is as a measure of how many distinct states the system can be in. You can relatedly also think of it as the amount of information that one can store in the system. A more familiar notion is the energy, uh, uh, when we hear about it uh, all the time. Roughly speaking, you can think of it as an ability of the uh, system to perform work. Now, the most familiar uh, uh, quantity is the temperature, which quantifies how hot or cold something is. Now, in many familiar systems, like Earth's oceans here, the temperature is not the same throughout. It varies from place to place. But here, it's because the system is not in equilibrium. The uh, Earth's oceans are heated differently in different parts, and uh, they're subject to external influences which vary in time. For systems in equilibrium, the description becomes much more simple, as uh, characterized by the laws of thermodynamics. So the zeroes law states that the temperature is the same throughout a system in equilibrium. The second law uh, characterizes how the energy changes uh, with entropy depending on temperature. And the second law says that entropy must always keep increasing. Now, these laws were al already formulated in the 1800s and uh, form a pillar of subjects known as thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Now, in the 1970s, it was realized that black holes actually behave very similarly, analogously to thermodynamic objects, which is characterized by the so-called laws of black hole mechanics. So the same laws apply if we replace the thermodynamical quantities by quantities that pertain to the black holes. So as you see here, it's natural to identify the black hole's mass with energy. It's area with entropy, and the surface gravity with temperature. So you might think that this is just a cute analogy built on rather circumstantial evidence. And indeed, that's what has been thought for a while in the scientific community. But eventually, people uh, realized that this is far more than an analogy. Uh, Jacob Bekenstein realized that in order for black holes to uphold the second law of thermodynamics in nature, their entropy indeed has to be proportional to the horizon area. Now, Stephen Hawking then famously calculated that black holes actually do radiate with a temperature proportional to surface gravity. And so we learn that black holes do behave like thermodynamic objects. Now, it's curious that in fact, the event horizon here seems to be playing a special role, despite the fact that there is nothing physical, physically located on the horizon. It's not like a planet with some hard surface or something. OK, 
So let me now tell you a little bit more about this relation between black hole entropy and event horizon area. Now, I realize that one shouldn't present equations in public talks, but this is a particularly nice equation, and it illustrates an important point, so I hope it doesn't scare you off. Well, first of all, what is an equation? Okay, if I ask you to come up with an example of one, many of you might think of a mathematical relation like 1 plus 1 equals 2. The left-hand side is equivalent to the right-hand side, but perhaps one side is more convenient to use than the other. In physics, our equations have a deeper meaning in that they tell a story. The two quantities on the left-hand side and right-hand side might be completely disparate, separate, uh, conceptually different objects. And the equal sign, then, is the revelation that they are actually equivalent. So this equation is of the latter kind. And it tells a particularly intriguing story, and one which we don't yet fully understand. It relates black hole entropy with event horizon area. So the fact that these two quantities are related at all is totally astonishing, to say the least. Conceptually, they're very different. Okay. Now, what about these other quantities? Well, apart from the number four, which you can all recognize, these other quantities are just a fundamental constants of nature. And uh, they basically set the scale. And in fact, uh, most of the time, physicists just leave them out of the equations. They set them to one uh, in order to minimize the clutter in the equations. But I've uh, kept them because their explicit presence tells us which areas of physics are important for understanding the lessons that this equation tells us. And in this case, we find that uh, you need to understand almost all uh, branches of physics. So it requires statistical mechanics, relativity, gravity, and quantum mechanics. Now, the fact that the equation relates all these areas of physics indicates that it's very deep. And it provides a hint of where we should go looking uh, if we want to find a, a unified description that unifies all of them. OK, now what is the actual surprise here, apart from these unexpected relations? Well, uh, in statistical mechanics, the number of microstates of a system uh, scales exponentially with the entropy um, at this given energy. And for a black hole, say solar mass black hole, uh, the entropy would be something like 10 to the 77. That's one with 77 zeros after it. And so the number of microstates of such a black hole would be one with this mind-bogglingly large number of zeros after it. So of course, I didn't write it down on a slide because writing it down, the number of digits would already take more than the number of atoms in the whole universe, just to denote. So where are all these microstates? Well, general relativity doesn't tell us where they are because, as we have already seen, black holes have no hair. So we need to look deeper. We need to ask this question in a framework that captures all these theories. Now, string theory is one such framework. And well, unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you about string theory. But uh, we, one of its uh, great achievements has been, indeed, identifying uh, precisely the black hole microstates in a controlled setting. OK, so um, let me now go on to uh, um, another uh, important uh, uh, area of uh, question that uh, comes out of black holes, since the uh, counting the microstate is not the only puzzle in town. Uh, a very important one is the black hole information paradox. It points to a fundamental clash between the laws of general relativity and the laws of quantum mechanics. So according to general relativity, a black hole irrevocably swallows up all the stuff that falls in, including the associated information. Now, even though the black hole subsequently radiates, as Hawking showed, that radiation doesn't carry away any information, but it nevertheless 
allows the black hole to evaporate completely, and so the information is lost forever. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, has an inherent time reversibility built in. So even if the information is, gets scrambled, you can run the time evolution backward and recover this information. So information can never be lost. And so our black hole uh, collapse and evaporation process is in clash with the laws of quantum mechanics. In other words, at least one of our ingredients in the description is incorrect, and we have to give up at least one of our cherished beliefs. Now, you might think that would be an embarrassment to us, but in fact, it's a great opportunity, precisely because we have a, a precise uh, paradox, we know where to go looking to repair it. Okay, so um, let me, well, I should say that uh, while lots of progress has been made on this question, especially in the recent years, it's fair to say that we're still searching for uh, uh, a full answer. And in fact, I think this problem is so deep that it will catalyze a new revolution in theoretical physics. Okay, but let me now go back to what we do know, which already uh, has spurred a sort of what you might think of as a mini revolution uh, in, in, in theoretical physics, which is the holographic principle uh, attributed to uh, Lenny Saskin and Gerald Truft. So to motivate it, consider how much information you could store in a box. In other words, how much entropy could you pack, pack into a given region? Well, let's for simplicity take a box uh, with uh, a cubic box with each side a foot long, and let's say you pack it with very informative books. So let's now ask how much uh, uh, information I can uh, then store in several such boxes. Well, one box has one cubic foot volume and six square feet surface area because it has six sides, and let's denote the total information in it by S, which is the symbol conventionally used for entropy. Okay. Two such boxes would have twice as much volume and presumably twice as much information, but only 10 uh, square feet surface area because the adjoining sides are no longer on the surface. So we can keep going. Three boxes would have three times as much information, four boxes four times, eight boxes eight times, and so forth. So our little exercise would have us conclude that the entropy, the information, scales with the volume. And this is indeed correct if the effects of gravity are negligible. But with gravity in play, things are uh, much more interesting. So no matter how little you pack in each box, eventually you get so many boxes that the net gravitational effect is so strong that the whole thing will collapse into a black hole. And now the information can no longer scale with the volume. Instead, it's given by the black hole entropy, which scales as the surface area. And so we also learn that black holes are the most entropic objects, because if you try to pack in any more information, the black hole would uh, simply grow. OK, so this leads us uh, to the holographic principle, which says that we can describe everything inside the box by, a th by amount of information that fits on its surface. In other words, there should be a two-dimensional theory which describes everything that's happening inside the three-dimensional box. Now, you might think that this is just like uh, watching movies because those portray our three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional screen. But there, you don't see what's lurking behind the foreground objects, just as you wouldn't see what's inside closed boxes. In contrast, the holographic description would know everything. Now, unfortunately, uh, the holographic principle doesn't tell us uh, the form of this two-dimensional theory. But fortunately, we have one great example, the so-called gauge gravity duality. But before I tell you about the gauge gravity duality, let me tell you what is a duality in general. 
Well, in a nutshell, it's the interesting uh, situation where the same physical reality has two different descriptions, which we call jewels of each other. Now, this is conveniently illustrated by this Escher drawing here. You can think of this picture in terms of the birds or in terms of the fish. But as is also typical with dualities, a given description is very naturally in one corner of the picture, but gets worse and worse as we get away from this corner. Now, in actual dualities, this often happens as we increase the strength of the interactions. In fact, uh, it's not just the, these variables that keeps changing uh, in, the, in the duals. Almost everything looks very different, and in fact, much more so than would be indicated by this picture. OK, so let me now come to, the, uh, to our wonderful example, the gauge gravity duality, also known as the ADS-CFT correspondence, which was formulated initially almost 20 years ago by Juan Maldacena in the context of string theory, although the correspondence uh, transcends this uh, context. So the uh, duality states that string theory, which among others is a theory of gravity, is exactly equivalent, describes the same physics, as a gauge theory, which is a non-gravitational quantum field theory with a special property that it looks the same at all scales, the so-called conformal field theory, CFT. So hence the name ADS. Well, um, I should say one more thing. So in the, this was a lot of words. So the most important point is that the two theories, string theory and gauge theory, live in different spaces. The string theory lives in the bulk of, bulk of a spacetime called anti-D sitter, ADS, which is a generalization of a hyperboloid, a maximally symmetric negatively curved spacetime. Whereas the gauge theory lives on the boundary of, of this ADS. So hence the name ADS-CFT. Now, in the early days, people liked to visualize this in an analogy of a soup can. So, String theory containing gravity is the soup inside, while the gauge theory is the label. But unlike an ordinary soup can, where the label just gives you a rough indication of what's inside, here it really is everything. So this correspondence uh, is called holographic because the two descriptions live in different uh, dimensions. Um, in fact, well, the terminology is derived from the holographic principle. Otherwise, it has nothing to do with actual holograms. In fact, uh, a better analogy, I think, would be a stereogram, like this 2D image, which if you look at in a certain way, you would perceive a 3D picture. Here is due to the correlations between these plotches, which your eyes interpret as parallax. In other words, since your, both of your eyes see, look from different slightly different positions, they see a slightly different image, and your brain is then very good in interpreting this to get the distance information. But then, of course, you can be fooled by these images. Now, in the real ADS-CFT, things would be infinitely more complicated with correlations between all points and this 2D splotch is replaced by a sensible CFT picture but one which looks very different from this emergent higher dimensional gravitational image. OK, so uh, the first question that one might ask, well, so you have seen that uh, the spatial information gets very scrambled between the two sides. And, uh, but it's not completely random. In fact, it's so delicate that things always conspire to work out just right. And so the first question one might ask is, what, how does the extra bulk direction get encoded in this holographic dual? Whatever happened to that? Okay. But fortunately, we can get an answer or partial answer already from the geometry of ADS. So let's take the Supkan representation of ADS and look from top. That describes a spatial geometry. So the spatial geometry is described by this very conveniently by another Escher picture. So here, each of these fish 
despite appearances, represents a chunk of space which is the same size everywhere. And so you would have to traverse infinitely many of these fish to get out on the, to the boundary. There's also a symmetry um, in that every point here is as good as any other. And so any vertex could be the origin of the space time. Okay, so now, uh, in order to describe a given region in the space, it has to res this holographic mapping has to respect the symmetry. In other words, it has to shift correctly when we shift the vertex. And so we conclude that for that to happen, the, uh, the position in the bulk corresponds to a scale or size on the boundary. So more concretely, points near the boundary would get encoded by small arcs, while points further away from the boundary would get encoded by larger arcs. Actually, I quite like this picture because it illustrates another interesting point, that these arcs are not unique. We can represent this point by this arc, or that arc, or any of the other ones. And in fact, uh, how a given bulk region gets represented by uh, the dual field theory has recently been argued to be related to a quantum error correction. Now, apart from uh, giving you a picture of how does the space get encoded, it also provides a nice intuition on what type of physics can be happening between the two sides. So for example, if you drop a particle from the boundary into ADS, that would fall in under the force of gravity and go sort of towards the center. On the dual field theory side, that would correspond to a small excitation that would spread out, just like a drop of ink in a glass of water or something. OK, so now I have pictorially illustrated one feature of the gauge gravity duality. But what is it good for? Well, it's in fact, great for loads of things. And in fact, uh, over 10,000 papers have been written that reference Maldacena's original paper. So recall that the duality relates string theory, which is a theory of gravity in higher dimensions, to a non-gravitational quantum field theory living in a lower dimensional space-time. The left-hand side, containing gravity, contains black holes. And these are, in fact, the uh, most um, um, natural objects in, 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 the, in this uh, gravity uh, theory. Now, even though uh, anti-de Sitter spacetime is not something that's describing our own cosmology of expanding universe, everything that I've told you about black holes does uh, pertain to this picture. The right-hand side. Uh, represents more familiar systems which are strongly interacting. In many cases, these take a form of a fluid, and uh, the behavior of this fluid is precisely mimicked by the uh, behavior of the horizon of this dual black hole. So we can describe a huge variety of flows, including the hitherto mysterious turbulence. In fact, Many condensed matter systems, uh, are, which are not that well understood directly, uh, are often uh, much better understood through studying the dual black hole, such as high temperature superconductivity and so forth. So nowadays, you often find uh, many more people studying black holes than just those who work on general relativity. OK. so. Also, uh, there are uh, many experimentally realizable systems that have a, a dual description in terms of black hole, uh, ranging from the ultra cold atoms with micro Kelvin temperatures to the qu hot quark gluon plasma with temperatures of several trillion Kelvin, so uh, spanning 20 orders of magnitude. Okay, so. Um, Indeed, the gauge gravity duality has proved invaluable tool to um, sort of studying these strongly coupled uh, field theory systems, which were familiar 
uh, with from almost everyday life in terms of a higher dimensional gravity on ADS, which is much easier. But conversely, one can go the other way, and one can actually try to study quantum gravity in ADS, which is hard but ne necessary for understanding the nature of space-time, in terms of the dual field theory, which can still be easier for certain things. And so there has been tremendous amount of progress uh, over the last two decades in this field. But uh, I, I must say, it's, we have, there's still so many uh, unexplained relations that are very tantalizing that I feel that we have barely seen the tip of the iceberg here. OK, so I have told you a little bit about the gauge gravity duality. And so let me come back to black holes. So black holes were instrumental in developing this duality. And, appeared at various stages. Uh, but in fact, black holes reappeared within the duality and turned out to be uh, uh, related to almost every system we wanted to describe. So what does this correspondence teach us about black holes? So previously, uh, we have seen that black holes are special uh, or extreme in some regards. Now we learn that they saturate all sorts of bounds. So apart from being the most perfect macroscopic objects, they're also closest to ideal fluid. Uh, they're uh, the most efficient in storing information. They are the fastest to equilibrate. They're the fastest to scramble information. And in fact, in a quantum information theoretic sense, they're also uh, the fastest computers. So, um, we, we're getting lots of hints here that quantum information theoretic constructs are very relevant to describing uh, these black holes. And in fact, I think that ultimately, uh, black holes will provide uh, sort of hints about the fundamental nature of space-time. So we now believe that space-time is not you know, fundamental down to arbitrarily small scales. Like a fluid, we would uh, imagine that at sufficiently small scales, space-time itself falls apart and has somehow inherently quantum origins. Now, what exactly those are is not at all clear, but we think that quantum entanglement might play a crucial role here. OK, so by now, you have seen black holes in several different guises, and from a historical standpoint, I think it's quite uh, nice uh, how much black holes have risen in prominence over the last century, starting from almost an embarrassment uh, to general relativity, to scarcely believed esoteric objects, to uh, astrophysically relevant objects, to uh, fascinating and beautiful mathematical uh, systems to constructs that underlie profound dualities which relate very disparate areas of physics, and finally to becoming virtually ubiquitous in describing almost everyday systems. Now, this has been quite an impressive climb, but we're not near the summit yet, and the best is still to come. I believe that black holes hold the key to unraveling quantum gravity, the unified theory that contains quantum mechanics and general relativity in a self-consistent framework. So the hints that we have been getting from the gauge theory, dual, gauge gravity duality, uh, about sort of the relation between space-time and quantum information, point to more fundamental structures waiting to be uncovered. Now, the resulting scientific revolution might be just around the corner, or it might still take years. But in the meantime, all these novel vistas have been uncovered, and there's much to relate and to explore. So I think that in 100 years of general relativity, our revelations regarding the nature of space-time have brought us to perhaps the most exciting era to be a theoretical physicist uh, pondering the mysteries of the universe. Thank you.